Okay, uh, shall we uh, start? Maybe we start right now. Okay, all right. Um, so it's my uh, pleasure to, uh, to uh, introduce today's speaker for the uh, uh, Life Sciences uh, Seminar Series. Um, uh, today's speaker uh, is uh, Dr. or Professor uh, Albert Goldberger uh, from the Unit of Theoretical uh, Chronobiology in the Faculty of uh, Sciences at the uh, Université Libre de Bruxelles. Uh, Dr. Uh, Goldberger uh, obtained his uh, master's degree in chemistry in 1969 uh, from the same university, University uh, Libre de uh, Bruxelles, and uh, uh, also his uh, PhD in chemistry uh, in uh, 1973 under the supervision of uh, uh, Elia Prigogine, Pri Pri I think that's how it's pronounced? That's right. Prigogine, okay. And he's actually a Nobel, a Nobel Prize uh, winner, so um, uh, that's, I mean, this is a huge accomplishment. Um, uh, Dr. Goldberger uh, then went on to do his postdoctoral work at the Wasman Institute uh, in Israel uh, between 1973 and 1975. And uh, he had uh, several uh, visiting positions until eventually uh, he uh, returned back to uh, Brussels to, uh, to become a, a professor uh, in, uh, at, the, at, in, uh, at the University of Brussels. Um, he's an author of um, over 200 uh, papers and uh, three different books and uh, several book chapters. Uh, he's a pioneer in the field of mathematical biology. Uh, and um, uh, I think his influence is felt everywhere in different uh, areas of research in mathematical biology. So um, I'm glad to have him here at the, at the seminar series and I look forward to hearing your talk. Dr. Goldbetter, can I just quickly ask, would you like all our questions to be kept for the end or uh, would you uh, take questions during the talk? Uh, what's the way that you prefer? Because the only uh, delicate point is that if I'm carried away during the talk for questions, I may not reach the end of the talk. So I would say maybe if something is really obscure, maybe during the talk, but then perhaps at the end. Okay. Yeah, if that is okay with you. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, um, I'll try to be as clear as possible. <laughs> Okay. Wonderful. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to give this talk at uh, McGill virtually. Uh, it's a, a very special date uh, for me, but not only for me, because March 9 uh, last year was the day on which uh, I thought that uh, uh, I really, I and my family should go into confinement, into lockdown. Anyway. Lockdown uh, really began only a few days later. I still attended the talk uh, on March 11 last year. But uh, so it has been a very strange year, difficult year. But uh, OK, but during this year, uh, I managed to, uh, to do some work. And, and one uh, of the tasks I had was to write a, a paper with the title of uh, the talk, uh, which I'm giving today. Uh, the, um, the, oops. Mm -hmm. So, ah, yeah. So, so the content is not based on uh, really the latest work which I gave, uh, which I did. Uh, rather, I will present a kind of synthesis of results, which are based on papers published with Jean Christophe Leloup in Brussels uh, during a decade. Um, and, uh, and we synthesized these results in uh, a paper which is really impressed now. Uh, it, uh, I have not yet corrected the final proofs. Uh, uh, and it's devoted to, to uh, the, the analysis of a model for the Mamili circadian clock. And what I will try to do, and what we did in this uh, paper, was to use the model uh, to uh, summarize 10 insights which uh, were uh, gained from, uh, from this model uh, from this computational approach to the Mamini circadian clock in regard to the mechanism of the circadian clock and uh, related sleep disorders and jet lag. So uh, it, is, uh, it should be uh, uh, noted that uh, the alternation of day and night is uh, a, a, a major uh, feature uh, of life on Earth. And Ashoff, one of the fathers of circadian rhythm research, wrote in 1981 
one of the most obvious adaptive features of life on Earth is the ability uh, of almost all species to change their behavior on a daily or 24 hour basis. And this alternation of day and night allowed for the emergence of uh, circadian rhythms, uh, which allowed the adaptation uh, to uh, this uh, uh, periodic nature of the environment. And uh, the, um, I will, as we will see, uh, the circadian clocks have many uh, uh, roles. One of them is controlling the sleep-wake cycle, and one effect is uh, jet lag. Uh, now, the term circadian rhythm was coined in the 1960s. It comes from the Latin circa dies, about one day. These are rhythms which have about 24-hour periodicity. And there were several books which were written on circadian clocks. One of the early books was by Erwin Buning uh, in the 1960s. A very good book here, uh, published in 1982, uh, was uh, written by uh, Moore, Eder, Sulzman, and Fuller. And it's um, devoted to, to a circadian clocks, which had become the prototype of uh, biological rhythms. Um, now, the, the, the research on biological rhythms goes back uh, for a long time already. Uh, this paper, one page paper, is remarkable. It is reproduced from the book I just mentioned, The Clocks That Time Us, by Moore, Eid, and colleagues. And the uh, George Dortuzman, who later became the the secretary of the French Academy of Science. And he was also a member of the French Academy, which is more literary. And uh, so he describes the movement of the leaves of a plant, which continue uh, to go up and down when the plant is kept in the obscurity, in darkness. And so he concludes that there is a rhythm. And now we would say that, uh, we would say that the rhythm is endogenous. It's not driven by the light cycle, but it is really produced by the plant itself. And then he makes the link uh, with uh, these uh, written in humans. And then in the second paragraph is really a research program for the next 200 years. So I don't have the time to read it, but it's, it's a fascinating uh, reading. Now, uh, if uh, you look at circadian rhythmicity uh, uh, in uh, the... Um, in, in living organism. Uh, one example is uh, shown here from the book of Buning. Uh, it is the rhythm of glucodermotor activity in the flying squirrel. So here you have uh, 24 hour, then the next 24 hour, the next, and so uh, during uh, more than 30 days. And the heavy line is uh, referring to the activity. And if they were distributed on a vertical column, uh, the rhythm would have a period of 24 hours, but it's tilted to the right, so it is 24 hours and uh, uh, 21 minutes. And so, uh, uh, what about modeling circadian rhythms? I will give a very brief introduction uh, to uh, the biology afterwards, but let me uh, point out that from the beginning, uh, there were uh, abstract non-molecular models were proposed, which were studied for circadian rhythms. And that was logical because nothing was known about the molecular mechanism. Although these rhythms have been known for hundreds of years, uh, nothing was known about their origin. And uh, so uh, there were initially uh, uh, abstract models which were being used for describing a population of oscillators. Winfrey uh, did that in the 1980s, and this is uh, the book that he published in which uh, he, uh, um, he develops that. Um, such models were also used by others in uh, the phase models in, uh, in other contexts. Uh, Glass and Mackey, who of course are well known in Montreal, uh, uh, where you are, oops, I have to go back, yeah. Uh, in their book, uh, they use the, such models and Steve Strogatz also. Now, besides these models, uh, other useful abstract models were uh, uh, taking, for example, the Van der Poel oscillator. And this was used by Wever uh, to, in the 1980s in Germany, and Richard Cronauer at Harvard, who published a long series of papers, and they are still uh, uh, coming 
continuing to appear, where uh, he used, he and his group used the Van der Poel oscillator, which is a model for an electrical oscillator, uh, as a model for the CTN clock uh, to account for different properties. So it's also a very useful uh, line of research. But to, to, to have, uh, as I say here below, to, uh, uh, to use um, uh, molecular models, you need to know the mechanism. And uh, we had to wait until the 1970s uh, for the first uh, advances uh, on the mechanism of the circadian clock. And a landmark paper was published in 1971 by Konopka and Benzer in PNAS. It was the PhD uh, thesis of Konopka. And uh, it was devoted to, to the rhythm of activity uh, in Drosophila. And uh, so the first finding was to uh, study the activity rhythm of in the fly. And these are two days on the first line, the next two days, the next two days on the subsequent lines. And there was a rhythm of activity of about 24 hours in continuous darkness. So the way to show that it is an endogenous rhythm is to show that the rhythm persists in constant conditions, for example, constant darkness. And uh, they found a mutant which had a period uh, which was shortened to 19 hours. And they found another period, uh, mutant uh, with a period which was larger up to 28 hours. And all these uh, mutations affected the same gene, which called, which would they called period, the per gene period, because of course it was uh, the, the gene involved in the periodic phenomenon. Now, one had to wait 20 years uh, approximately for the next uh, advance, which was due to the group of uh, Rosbach and Hall, working with uh, Paul Hardin, and they showed that um, the, the gene coding for PER uh, is regulated by the product of the gene. So there is a feedback, a negative feedback, of the Drosophila period gene product on the circadian cycling of its RNA level. And uh, this is uh, taken from a paper by the group of Rosbach a few years later, 1994, where they studied gene expression. These are the two curves here, Y two curves. One is in the eye, the other in the brain. And the next two curves show the same evolution of the protein per. So one sees that first there is one peak of expression per 24 hour. This was first found in continuous darkness, but then they studied that in a light dark cycle to obtain information about the timing of the peak of the, of the RNA. That's the per mRNA. And you see that the peak of per mRNA uh, uh, occurs a few hours after the light to dark transition. Uh, on the other hand, the protein per accumulates with a lag. And what is remarkable is that the, as the protein is rising, the RNA is decreasing. And this is what led uh, uh, Rosbach and his colleagues to uh, hypothesize that the product of the, of the gene was feeding back negatively on uh, its own transcription. So uh, the next piece of information that uh, was obtained by Rosbach and his group was that the protein per is phosphorylated. So uh, it was not clear at the time what the role was of this phosphorylation of the period protein, but uh, it played an important role and it controlled the period. So a model for the Drosophila circadian clock uh, could be based on negative feedback and per phosphorylation. I go quickly now uh, reviewing these data because they will serve uh, to build a model that I will use as a building block for the model for the Mamiani circadian clock. Uh, and this is the model which I proposed at the time, uh, oops, uh, which is based on negative feedback. So it's a model uh, for, uh, this is the nucleus of one cell, the nuclear per protein feeds back negatively on the transcription of the per gene. The per gene is transcribed and then the RNA goes to the cytosol, translated into protein. And because there, it was found that there is multiple phosphorylation, the model included two reversible phosphorylation steps. This is the kinase, and this is the phosphatase, the phosphorylation. And at the time, it was assumed that uh, phosphorylation was marking the protein for degradation. And then the protein goes into the nucleus. 
And indeed, it was found that uh, phosphorylation marks the protein for ubiquitination followed by degradation. So this model is governed by five variables, five differential equations. And uh, uh, the, these are nonlinear equations. But the important term here is the regulatory term, which takes the form of a Hill function. N is the Hill coefficient, describing the degree of cooperativity of repression by the uh, nuclear pair here, Pn, of the synthesis of M, the messenger RNA coding for the pair. For per. And uh, this is the way that the rate here, the function, uh, goes from a maximum to zero as the protein increases, the per protein. So this is a model uh, for negative autoregulatory negative feedback. And if you integrate numerically these equations, you can find conditions in which you find sustained oscillations, uh, which correspond to the evolution to a limit cycle. So these are the evolution uh, from two different initial conditions going to the same closed curve. And this is in a plane <clears throat> formed by uh, the total per protein and per mRNA. It's a projection. And if you look at now what is the period of the oscillations as a function of a control parameter, for example, the per degradation rate, uh, you see that there is a range in which oscillations occur. And this range, this is the period in hours going from 15 to some 60 hours. And this range um, is bounded by two critical values of the per degradation rate. And in this range, the, um, the period go, uh, varies as a function of this parameter. So insight number one, uh, which I can uh, uh, summarize here, uh, there will be 10 insights in the course of the talk. The first insight, which is uh, based on the model for the second clock, but it's also valid, of course, for the mammine second clock, which I will come to in a, in a moment. Second oscillations due to feedback regulation only occur in a parameter domain bounded by critical values. Inside this domain, the amplitude and period of the oscillations vary as a function of parameter values. Outside the oscillatory domain, the second control network evolves toward a stable steady state corresponding to the absence of oscillatory behavior. Of course, it could go there with damped oscillations. Arrhythmic behavior, which is sometimes observed, arrhythmic behavior methods originate either from a mutation in one of the signal clock genes, which alters the functionality of the corresponding protein, or from the operation of the signal clock network in a domain of parameter values corresponding to a stable non-oscillatory state. Now, this model uh, had to be uh, modified uh, afterwards because, uh, uh, because additional genes were found. But this, before uh, turning to that, I would, of course, like to point out that Brian Goodwin, already in the 1960s, uh, uh, proposed a model for oscillatory behavior based on negative feedback. But his model was not uh, uh, applied to circadian clocks. It was applied to metabolic oscillations. And it's a trivial model based on end product inhibition all steps are linear except the highly nonlinear feedback term. However, Rudolf and Rensing wrote a series of papers beginning in the 1990s where they used Goodwin's model to account for properties of the circadian clock. And some authors continue to use Goodwin's model because of its simplicity. I should note that the Zofila model, which I discussed, can also be reduced to three variables if you take a single phosphorylation term. Now, there are other, mute, the other uh, genes. Uh, Michael Jung, for example, uh, found uh, the, the gene timeless, and which uh, calls for the team protein. And the team protein makes a complex whisper. And there were four papers at the same time in 1996 uh, describing how a uh, timeless protein is uh, degraded uh, and uh, the degradation rate increases in the light phase. And this provides a way uh, to couple the circadian clock to light. So light acts by increasing the parameter which uh, measures the degradation rate of the team protein. And you see this model incorporates per and per phosphorylation and team and team phosphorylation and the formation of a complex between per and team. And this is the complex here which goes into the nucleus and represses the expression of the team and per genes. So this is a 10-variable model. 
And because now we incorporate the effect of light on this parameter, we can study the model in conditions of darkness, continuous darkness, called DD, uh, with a constant uh, low rate of degradation in continuous light with a continuous high value of the degradation rate. You see there are damped oscillations. Or in a light dark cycle, where you have a square wave variation between a high value in the light phase and uh, a, a small value in the dark phase. And uh, uh, let me now move to the Mamin second clock. In the Mamin second clock, there is a pacemaker controlling the second clock, which is located in the hypothalamus. This is the hypothalamus here. This is the pituitary. In the hypothalamus, there is uh, what is called the supracasmatic nucleus. And this nucleus is the pacemaker uh, of the circadian clock. It contains some 10,000 neurons. And uh, there is a photic information which is conveyed directly to the SCN here from the retina. So that's how light can influence the circadian clock uh, behavior. Uh, at the end of the, at the beginning of the uh, years 2000, <clears throat> progress was made on the elucidation of the molecular mechanism of the circadian clock in mammals. It's uh, related to what we discussed in Drosophila. Uh, there are two genes, clock and BMAL1 here, clock and BMAL1, who make, which make a complex. And this complex induces the expression of uh, uh, the genes per and cry. There are two, uh, three per genes and two cry genes. And per and cry make a complex, and this complex inhibits the activators clock BMAL1. So it is again a negative feedback, but it is indirect. It is indirect autoregulatory negative feedback. Uh, now, uh, the, the a remarkable paper, uh, which I show here from the group of Akamura, now in Kyoto, um, um, studied the synchronization of SCN cells and the way uh, that uh, the circadian clock can be characterized. And what they did was to couple a luciferase reporter to measure per one expression in SCN slices in mice. And what I will show you now is a movie which uh, is taken from the, from the oops, I tried to, to remove here uh, the, the pictures down, but I don't know because I don't see the full, uh, uh, so maybe, maybe it's here. Yes. Uh, so uh, this um, movie, what I will see, what you will see is uh, the luciferase reaction measuring uh, the, um, uh, the expression of the per gene for four successive days. You will see above the flashing SCN and below the traces measured in hundreds of cells. These are the SCN, they are two nuclei, and these are the uh, expression the measure of the expression of the per gene. So with a period which is about uh, 24 hours. And you see that there is a beautiful synchronization of, uh, this, uh, of these oscillations, um, which, um, which are produced uh, by, the, by the oscillatory uh, network uh, controlling the circadian clock. Now, uh, oops, sorry. So uh, now, how can we model that uh, uh, system? Uh, as a, is a simple, simplified version, there are two genes, uh, clock and BMAL1, and these are the, the proteins. Here, this one is nearly constitutive. This one oscillates in the course of time. Clock and BMAL1 make a complex, which induces the expression of the per and cry genes. Now, the per and cry proteins uh, make a complex, which inhibits clock BMAL1 uh, by making a tetrameric complex, which is inactive. Light induces the expression of the per gene. You may remember that in Drosophila, light was, in due, was increasing, was enhancing the degradation rate of TIM protein. Here, a light induces the expression of the per genes. And there's another loop here where a clock BMAL1 negatively uh, regulates the expression of BMAL1. So uh, a more detailed version of the model, uh, showing more details, 
is shown here. This is the per, per transcription giving per mRNA, which gives the per protein in the cytosol. Uh, try transcription, try mRNA, try protein, try and per make a complex in the cytosol, which goes to the nucleus. And then here you have the same for clock and BMAL1. Clock BMAL1 make a complex, which binds to per cry, and this goes to the nucleus. Uh, and these are degradation products. And per here is phosphorylated by a protein kinase. I will refer to that later, the casein kinase 1 epsilon. And this phosphorylation marks the protein for degradation. So light uh, is here. Light induces per transcription. And uh, uh, there is an additional intermediate found by the group of Schibler, uh, which involved, which is called reverb alpha. Clot B1 induces reverb alpha, which is involved in the repression uh, of B1 expression. So uh, this system is described by 16 differential equations. Uh, and uh, uh, for mRNAs of per cry and BMAL1, uh, for the phosphorylated, non phosphorylated per cry complex, for the phosphorylated, non phosphorylated proteins per and cry and BMAL1, and this is the inactive complex. Uh, when you add reverb alpha, you have to add three more equations. Now, this, of course, is uh, rather horrifying uh, if you want to, to think uh, of doing some analytical work. But, uh, but, uh, the, um, but that's the price to pay uh, to have a molecular level. Uh, it turns out that Kronauer uh, and his group uh, reduced this system of equations to uh, the form of a Van der Poel oscillator, uh, which in a way validates their work, which they did with the Van der Poel oscillator as a model for the Mamillus circadian clock. But the problem is, uh, uh, so the problem, I would say, the, the, the fact is that when you reduce that to the Van der Poel oscillator, then you lose, of course, the direct link with molecular entities like per, cry, phosphorated per, and so on. So I will come back to that. So other models have been proposed for the Manitian clock. Uh, Forger and Peskin, oops, sorry, uh, proposed one. Uh, the group of uh, Hans-Peter Herzl uh, proposed the model. Uh, the group of Frank Doyle, uh, who is now at Harvard, proposed the model. And uh, uh, Forger and Kim, Kim is now in uh, South Korea, uh, proposed a model also. And, and there are additional models. I will concentrate on the model uh, which was proposed by Leloup and myself, uh, which I showed, uh, because they, uh, because uh, uh, see, see Similar models, similar results have been obtained in animals, at least partially. And it's useful to propose a, a unified view of all the phenomena which you can obtain in one computational approach. But of course, this is not to mean that it's the only one. I, I, I mentioned uh, alternative approaches. Uh, the first thing to note is that uh, these equations, when you integrate them numerically, uh, in some conditions, uh, produce sustained oscillations in continuous darkness. So these are the RNAs of uh, the BMAL1 per and cry. And you note that, as written here, BMAL1 os uh, mRNA oscillates in antiphase with the RNAs of per and cry, as observed experimentally. And this is logical because uh, they, are, <coughs> uh, they have opposite roles, right? One is inhibits the action of the other. Uh, and here are the corresponding proteins. Uh, and one can find parameter values, and there are unfortunately many parameters, but each of them measures uh, specifically a biochemical process, like for example, rate of phosphorylation, rate of dephosphorylation, protein degradation, protein synthesis, and so on, or mRNA synthesis and degradation. What about the light dark cycle? Now, if we vary uh, the rate of per expression in a square wave manner, being high in the light phase, this is the light phase here, and the dark phase is here, the rate of expression of per is low in the dark phase, then one sees that one can untrain the oscillations by the light dark cycle. And, uh, but the phase here depends on the parameter values. For example, this is the peak of per mRNA. 
which occurs here in the LIDAC cycle. Uh, you see that if you change a parameter, it occurs in the dark phase, not in the light phase. So the, the parameters govern the position of the phase, the phase, the period, uh, and the amplitude. And uh, this is then the insight too, which summarizes these results. Uh, there are elements in the circuit network mechanism which are sensitive to light. For in mammals, for example, light and enhances the expression of the purge genes. While the circadian clock oscillates autonomously in constant external conditions, continuous light or continuous darkness. Uh, note, by the way, that in mammals, uh, oscillations persist in continuous light and continuous darkness. While in uh, Drosophila, oscillations were damped in continuous light and uh, uh, persisted in continuous darkness. This is because light affects the clock differently. Here, it induces gene expression in Drosophila it enhances uh, protein degradation. So uh, oscillations occur with a period close to 24 hours. Uh, it can be able to oscillate at a period equal to the light dark cycle, 24 hour. Uh, and uh, upon entrainment, the phase of the second clock with respect to the LD cycle depends on parameter values. And so does the range of entrainment. Now, what about uh, the, the mechanism of the oscillations? It's easy uh, to uh, do in the, to, to suppress in the model the synthesis of the per protein. Uh, this, of course, is much easier to achieve in the model than in the experiment. In the model, it's, it's sufficient to put equal to zero the rate of protein synthesis. Of protein synthesis. And, and this, it was not surprising to see that oscillations disappeared, right? Oscillations disappeared and the system reached a stable steady state. However, surprisingly, uh, when we modified uh, some other parameters in the absence of synthesis of PER, we recovered oscillations. This is puzzling, but it indicates that there are multiple sources of oscillations. So this is the scheme, which I already showed. Uh, so we have clock and BMAL1 inducing PER and CRY. PER CRY represses um, the activation, inhibits rather, the activation by clock and BMAL1. And, uh, and so what do we do uh, when we suppress the synthesis of PER? We uh, suppress the negative feedback loop. And of course, logically, uh, we lose the oscillations because the negative feedback plays a key role in the oscillatory uh, phenomenon, in the mechanism. However, there is another oscillation. Where is it? Uh, and uh, the, the, the other oscillatory mechanism is here. As I mentioned, uh, clock B mal one, the complex here, uh, represses the expression of uh, B mal one. This involves the protein refrab alpha, which I mentioned. So this negative feedback is able by itself to induce oscillations. So insight number three, the second clock network may contain multiple sources of oscillatory behavior, which might be unmasked in conditions where the negative feedback loop involving per and cry ceases to operate. However, to generate rhythmicity on its own with a period that may not necessarily be circadian, this alternative mechanism must operate in the parameter domain corresponding to oscillatory behavior. Maybe, of course, it is outside the oscillatory domain, and so it is silent. So uh, what about disorders linked to the uh, circadian clock? So far, I uh, discuss mainly the mechanism of the oscillations. But now what about uh, uh, physiological disorders related to dysfunctions of the clock? Um, and uh, 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 the, 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 the disorders I will, uh, I will discuss are related to sleep, uh, but I will also discuss jet lag. But there are many other disorders related to dysfunction of the circadian clock. Mood disorders, uh, they are links with cancer, uh, diabetes, and many other topics. And actually, there are many uh, recent reviews which are devoted to the link between circadian clock and human health. I only list here three examples published in the last uh, five years. Uh, and uh, uh, all these references, by the way, will be uh, found in, uh, in, in, the, um, in the paper, which, we, which is in press, which I mentioned. So what about sleep disorders? In 2001, uh, a remarkable paper was published 
by uh, the group of uh, Louis Ptasek uh, and uh, Fu uh, at, uh, now at UCSF and also Christopher Jones. Before mentioning this paper, uh, this paper I, I of course would like to point out that the role of the circadian clock in sleep was well known uh, because if uh, in the animals uh, you make a lesion of the SCN, you perturb and you lose the rhythm of the sleep-wake cycle. So uh, it was known uh, that and in some cancer patients uh, where the SCN are affected by a tumor uh, growth, uh, then uh, they also have a, 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 a huge sleep disorders. But this paper was remarkable because they identified a mutation uh, which uh, uh, produced what they call the familial advanced sleep phase syndrome. And what uh, Fu and Ptasek showed is that there is a family in uh, Utah, which was I, I studied, and uh, over several generations, some of the members of the family are affected by the syndrome in which uh, they go to sleep, uh, they go around uh, 7 p.m. Uh, and then they sleep, uh, but they also get up early, around 4 a.m. So, so the sleep duration is normal, but what is uh, conspicuous is that there is an advance of the phase of sleep. So they have to go to sleep, they fall asleep. So uh, what is remarkable is that they could characterize the mutation which was involved. And the mutation affects upper gene. Uh, I said there are three genes. This is human PER2 gene. Uh, the human PER2 gene is affected by a mutation and uh, uh, in its phosphorylation site. So what uh, uh, summarizing the result of, of that observation, there is a mutation in, in the PER2 protein, but the same phenotype is observed uh, when one mutates the kinase, which phosphorylates the PER protein the casein kinase 1 epsilon, the decreased phosphorylation of the per protein is accompanied by a decrease in period, uh, by a one hour or so. The decrease in period is itself accompanied upon entrainment by the LD cycle by a change in the phase. The phase is advanced. So people who are affected by the syndrome can be untrained by the LIDAC cycle, but because they have a shorter endogenous period, uh, uh, a shorter autonomous period in continuous darkness, uh, they uh, are untrained with a phase advance. And uh, uh, we can study that in the model. That's the advantage of uh, studying a molecular model because phosphorylation of the per protein is considered explicitly in the model. And this reaction rate here corresponds to the rate of the casein kinase one epsilon reaction, phosphorylating per and marking it for degradation. So we studied the circadian period in continuous darkness, that is the dark line here, the thick line, as a function of the maximum rate of per phosphorylation. There are two curves, one is the period, one is the phase, I the phase in LD, uh, measured here on the right. The period here in DD is measured on the left. And uh, when we vary the rate of phosphorylation, you see that there is a non-monotonous dependence of the period of the oscillations, which goes from some uh, uh, 23 hours to some uh, uh, tw uh, uh, 30 hours. And uh, this here in white is the range of entrainment by the light dark cycle. I will, I will come back after to discuss what happens outside the range of entrainment. But in the entrainment domain, the phase of the oscillations varies with the rate of phosphorylation. Let me first point out uh, something about the period. Points one and two here, this point and this point, show that the same period of 24 hour is obtained for two different values of the rate of phosphorylation. This is because of the nonlinear dependence. Another point of interest is the, in A, B, and C for the phase. You see here is uh, advancing. If, uh, for example, if you uh, take uh, the phase here, the, 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 the phase here, we are uh, at this point, but if you are in A, you are advanced by a few hours. So there is a domain here where if you increase the rate of phosphorylation, rather if you decrease, sorry, if you decrease the rate of phosphorylation, you will decrease the period and you will advance the phase. 
And this is exactly what is observed in the familial advance, uh, sleep phase advance syndrome. So in site four, in constant conditions, LL or DD, the period of the second clock varies as a function of control parameters, such as the rate of perforce correlation by the kinase, casein kinase one epsilon, which leads to per degradation. Due to its non-monotonous variation, multiple values of the control parameter may sometimes correspond to a given value of the autonomous period in DD. Thus, the second clock may have the same period of 24 hours at three distinct values of the rate of per phosphorylation. And uh, uh, another insight is that in a certain range, the second clock can be untrained by the lag dike cycle. The phase of the clock becomes progressively advanced with respect to the LD cycle as the rate of per phosphorylation decreases. So there is a range of values of the phosphorylation rate in which the autonomous period of the clock also decreases as the function of the parameter. The decrease in period and the phase advance are both associated with the decrease in perforce relation as observed in FASPS, the familiar advanced sleep phase syndrome. Now, the model suggests conversely that an increase in perforce relation may lead to the uh, 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 opposite effect both an increase in autonomous period and a delay in the phase of the clock upon untrained by the lag cycle. And this is a syndrome which is also known. It's the delayed sleep phase syndrome, DSPS. Note, however, that uh, there can be other sources, other explanations for these effects. For example, uh, the advanced sleep phase syndrome in humans can also originate from a mutation in the cry protein, in the cryptochrome 2, the cry 2 protein. And uh, this is also worked by Ptasek and Fu. And uh, a very interesting paper by the group of Herzl uh, 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 addressed the issue of the phase, uh, uh, how to do the phase uh, of the circadian clock upon circadian uh, entrainment by the light dark cycle. And uh, this provides a, a, a more analytical view of these effects, which are addressed here by means of numerical simulations. Now, um, of course, there is a continuum uh, of, um, of phase of the circadian clock. And this was well summarized by uh, a quantity called uh, a property called the chronotype, introduced by Ronneberg in um, Munich. Ronneberg proposed a chronotype, chronotype to characterize the sleep phase. Uh, and the prototype is just the middle, uh, the middle time of the sleep phase. For example, if you go to sleep at midnight and you awake at eight o'clock in the morning, you have a corporate chronotype of four hours. Four hours is the, the mid sleep. Uh, and this is shown here, for example. This is the mid sleep on the work days. And uh, it goes uh, here from around uh, one to uh, mean around four o'clock, and then it goes down. This is the heavy line is for people uh, uh, less than 21 uh, years old. Uh, this one is between 21 and 30, and this one is uh, uh, above 30. And so uh, Ronneberg uh, has a questionnaire. Uh, more than 100,000 people filled that questionnaire, and that allowed him to have such a, a nice continuous curve characterize the chronotype. Uh, what I discussed so far is the familiar advanced sleep phase syndrome, which corresponds to uh, this uh, part here, or the delayed sleep phase syndrome, which corresponds to, uh, to that part. And this is what happens uh, on three days. People can sleep longer, and that is the reason why uh, the chronotype is uh, larger. Uh, so this defines morning type or evening type. These are morning types, these are evening types. And um, uh, the, delay, the delayed or advanced sleep phase syndrome correspond to extremes of these. Uh, so uh, we encountered a problem in the model for the main circadian clock. Uh, and I think that this is often uh, the, the, um, the moment where the model becomes very interesting uh, when it does not work. And uh, what happened is that uh, for months, approximately six months, we could not account for entrainment of the clock by the light dark cycle. I showed previously a result where we, we had entrainment of the, by the LD cycle. 
But this, we, uh, we obtained the result after this period uh, where we could not succeed to do so. And, uh, and this problem, as I just said, led to new insights. So uh, this here shows a diagram now established with respect to two parameters. Uh, here is still the rate of perforce correlation, which was used in the one parameter diagram, the one parameter bifurcation diagram before. And uh, so horizontally uh, here, we, uh, for months, we were in a domain where there was no entrainment, only quasi-periodic oscillation, no entrainment. And uh, so we decided to study, that's the advantage of models, that you can freeze the frames in time. Uh, and so you can just study in time, as, was in, as I will do in a moment, to see what happens. And this is the other parameter, which is the rate of cry synthesis. So we found that there was absence of entrainment at low levels of cry. And um, so we were here. And uh, it suffice to increase uh, the rate of cry synthesis, let's say, from going for 1 to 2, 0.1 to 0.2. This is the entrainment domain. And below, we have here the bifurcation diagram showing the period as a function of the rate of cry, uh, as a function of the other parameter, rate of cry synthesis. The red curve is continuous light. The blue curve continues darkness. And the green curve uh, in an LD cycle. And you see that in an LD cycle, there, were, there are many points here showing that it's difficult uh, to, uh, to define a maximum because we do not have periodic behavior. But the value here of the rate of cry synthesis above which uh, there is phase locking, and then we have a period of 24 hours exactly. We have entrainment. So point 0.1 and point 0.2 here, the below the region of entrainment uh, and in the region of entrainment here, that is point 0.1 and point 0.2, uh, are shown in that diagram. So uh, entrainment was restored, can be restored by raising the level of cry. And uh, now uh, the way we found about the role of cry following. When we were out now, this is the behavior in point one here, in the region where there is no entrainment. And uh, what is shown here, over a period of over a duration of some 45 days, there is a light phase, which is the, the white part, and the dark phase, the gray zone. Uh, we have here the blue curve is the per mRNA, and the red curve is the protein per, the free protein per in the cytoplasm. And you see that uh, in the light phase, light induces per expression. So there is an increase in the blue curve. The per is expressed. And then in the dark curve, expression stops uh, or is very low. And then we have a decrease in the RNA because it's degraded. Now, there's a lag for the rise in per after the rise in per mRNA, the, pro the, the RNA codes for the protein. So we have an increase. But because the RNA is dropping, then there is a decrease in protein. But the decrease is not sufficient. So there is a buildup, prog progressive buildup. And this progressive buildup goes up to a point beyond which there is a decrease, finally, with ups and downs, uh, small ups and downs. And so why do we see that? Because usually, the per protein makes a complex with cry. And this complex inhibits the activators clot B mal one when there is too much per, or alternatively, too little cry, uh, there is not enough per cry complex which is made. And so the feedback, the negative feedback on uh, uh, clock B mal one is not strong enough. And, and so this is the reason why the per protein does not go down enough. And so when we observe the progressive buildup, we reasoned that perhaps uh, we could increase the level of cry uh, and see what happens. And this is exactly uh, what was happening. Uh, uh, as I showed you, uh, uh, we, 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 we could restore uh, the oscillations. So then the question we asked was, if, we, if it's so easy in the model to fail uh, to have entrainment, is there a syndrome which is known? Do we know some, something in physiology which can relate to that? Yes, indeed. 
there is a syndrome which is called the non 24 hour sleep wake cycle syndrome. Now, the non 24 hour sleep wake cycle syndrome is a syndrome in which the circadian clock never locks to a certain phase, it drifts continuously. It's called free running. So the clock runs at a period which is different from 24 hours. Maybe it is 24.5 or 25.2. So there is a drift. And uh, it is well known to occur in blind people because blind people are not uh, synchronized with the light dark cycle. And they can be synchronized chemically by melatonin, for example, or by, uh, by, by uh, the, the, the clock watch when they go to work. But, uh, but what we find here is a syndrome uh, in blonde blind people. And this exists indeed. indeed. Not, it's not very frequent. Uh, some, some authors call this an orphan uh, disease. An orphan syndrome, it's not a disease, an orphan syndrome. But of course, it's very annoying. Sometimes uh, uh, people will go to sleep uh, uh, in the light phase, sometimes in the dark phase. And, um, and so if you ask people around you, uh, you will probably find some people who, uh, under, who, who, who uh, experience such, uh, uh, such a situation. So, uh, and uh, sometimes, so it's the same uh, drifting which I showed, but if you look at the phase here, so day by day, there is an advance every day in the course of time, and then it's progressive, and then uh, rapidly there is a jump in the phase through the dark phase, and then in the light phase, a progressive advance. So these phase jumps are known uh, clinically. So in the non 24 hour sleep wake cycle syndrome, sometimes you have phase jumps uh, in patients exhibiting this kind of uh, site number six for certain parameter values, the circadian clock model predicts the failure. I will uh, put some light here because the evening is coming here. So uh, the prediction train by the light dark cycle occurs in the model. For example, when the level of cry protein is too low compared to the level of PER, with which it formed a complex. Increasing cry above a critical level restores the capability for entrainment. Such a phenomenon might be the cause of non-24 hour sleep wake written disorder in non-blind people. And interestingly, um, uh, a group uh, has recently shown that uh, the stability of wake sleep cycles requires robust degradation of the period protein. So these observations uh, could be related to uh, the effect of an accumulation of PER uh, on uh, the lack of uh, stability of the sleep wake cycle. Um, and this is another example uh, of the, oh, this is the entrainment, by the way. You see that when there is entrainment by the square wave variation of the phosphorylation rate of the per protein, uh, the system here is untrained and the phase is constant, phase locking. But here is an example which I already showed in which the phase is drifting. And this is the show showing the drift of the phase in the course of time. Now, sometimes we found in the model very uh, unusual behavior. I take again the diagram here, the two parameter bifurcation diagram, and I will focus now what happens, what happens near the domain of entrainment in points five and six. So there is no entrainment, but we are very close to the region of entrainment. There, what we found by numerical integration of the equations is this behavior. This is in point, in point five, just above the tongue, and this is the, the point six below the tongue. And you see that there is, these are huge periods of time, 700 days, here 2,000 days. For a long bout of time, we have here near entrainment to 20 to 24 hours in a light dark cycle. But then suddenly there is a departure. Here you see the phase, and then suddenly a departure, a rapid, rapidly you go through a dark phase, and then again you stabilize for a long time. The period of these peaks here is 300 days, nearly one year. And here uh, at the point uh, below the diagram, so that was above, now we are just below. Uh, we see here uh, that uh, we have a long periodicity of uh, uh, nearly three years. So uh, to my knowledge, we have, uh, we have not seen uh, uh, some clinical accounts describing these very unusual long patterns of quasi entrainment, but these are predicted by the model. Uh, um, accordingly, they are predicted, admittedly, 
they are predicted in a very particular parameter domain. So physiologically, it may not be uh, uh, observed, uh, uh, or, but in principle, it may occur. So very near the domain of entrainment, the Sikina clock model predicts the occurrence of long periodic patterns in which the clock is apparently synchronized for long durations before ceasing to be untrained. Um, the, such patterns might correspond to long bouts of apparent synchronization of the sleep-wake cycle separated by relatively rapid jumps in its phase. Now, uh, about jet lag, uh, we can study jet lag in the model uh, simply by, uh, by extending for a delay, for example, extending by eight hours the duration of a light phase. And if we do that, so you, you can mimic uh, the, 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 the transatlantic flights either westward or eastward. And uh, a delay, you see that uh, this is before the delay, this is after the delay, the clock resynchronizes. Uh, here it takes approximately eight days. So it's like the rule of thumb that the number of days needed to resynchronize corresponds to the number of hours uh, in the phase shift of the LD cycle. And uh, uh, this illustrates the resynchronization, the progressive resynchronization. Uh, if you look at the phase, this is the, the delay of eight hours by increasing the duration of the light phase. And you see that here the phase reaches a new steady state here uh, after some eight days. Uh, now, uh, in the model, uh, the, we, we here the first uh, row is about an eight hour advanced phase shift, and the uh, bottom row is about a delay of eight hours. And he, this is done for three hours of the autonomous period in continuous darkness one below 24, one close to 24 hours, and one above. And you see that you can synchronize either in the same direction, but here, for example, an advance in the course of time, an advance or a delay. Okay, this is called autodromic resynchronization. This is called antidromic resynchronization. And uh, the same uh, happens with the delay phase shift. So the insight number eight, uh, uh, you can uh, summarize that you can resynchronize after a phase shift either in uh, autodromic or in an antidromic uh, manner. And the selection of the mode of resynchronization depends on the autonomous period of the clock and on the magnitude and direction of the phase shift. Now, let me come to an, ex an unexpected result. Here, when we study the behavior as a function of a parameter which controls the period, here, for example, and we did that for a six hour phase shift, eight hour phase shift, 10 hour phase shift, delays in red, advances in blue. Let's look at here, for example. You see that when we vary this parameter, we vary continuously the endogenous period, the autonomous period of the clock. And here you, you see that we have antidromic entrainment or resynchronization followed by autodromic resynchronization. There is a switch, there is a transition. The same for the advances, autodromic followed by antidromic. And what is interesting is that at the transition point here, the resynchronization times can be very large. For example, up to 40 or 50 or 60 days. So it could well be if this could occur physiologically, provided that the parameters of the clock are such that uh, they, they give the, 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 the right period for observing that. And it also depends on the magnitude and direction of the phase shift. So it may be very rare physiologically, but in principle, you could have extremely long a resynchronization time corresponding to severe cases of jet lag. And uh, so these very long time for resynchronization are sometimes observed in the model uh, when the clock appears to hesitate between autodromic and antidromic re entrainment. And uh, uh, so in, in this uh, uh, neighborhood, the time for reestablishing re the original phase of the clock with respect to the new LD cycle can increase dramatically. This could correspond to an extreme form of sleep wave cycle disorder uh, associated with jet lag, but they are observed in a narrow range of condition, which might be rare physiologically. What about pharmacological treatments reducing jet lag? Uh, there are two uh, ways uh, that have been described. One way uh, involves vasopressin. Now, vasopressin 
is, uh, uh, the, um, is the signal involved in the synchronization of SCN cells in the hypothalamus. And uh, so uh, vasopressin receptor antagonists were shown by the group of Akamura to accelerate recovery from jet lag. And it seems that the way it works is by preventing intracellular synchronization. It is as if synchronized intercellular synchronization uh, uh, makes the cells robust with respect to external perturbation. And for example, uh, you resynchronize uh, more rapidly when you inhibit the resynchronization as compared to when you uh, do not uh, inhibit resynchronization. And another uh, interesting way uh, to control uh, the uh, jet lag, uh, of course, these are interesting because so many people take uh, the, the uh, transatlantic flights. I must say that the problem does not uh, uh, pertain to our current condition because uh, flying, of course, uh, is, uh, has been suspended for, for, for months, nearly for one year. But, uh, but when the flying will resume, then, uh, then uh, this may offer an interesting way uh, pharmacologically, if there are, of course, no other side effects, clearly. That remains to be demonstrated. What they found, that's a group of Andrew Loudon and uh, David Bechtold, what they found is that uh, an inhibitor of casein kinase 1 epsilon or 1 delta epsilon or 1 casein kinase epsilon casein kinase 1 delta, another isoform. So the enzyme which forswed its spur, when you inhibit the enzyme, you speed up circadian clock recovery. We try to recover the result in the model, but we failed to Uh, it is still an open question whether we can account for this behavior in the model. Uh, I um, remind that, uh, that um, casein kinase 1 epsilon is the control parameter which is considered in the model. Now, uh, I come to the end of the talk. Uh, what about perturbation of the clock? Uh, perturbation of the clock, uh, it's important to determine their effect because they were shown to be linked with cancer and of course, uh, they uh, play a major role in shift work. Uh, and up to 20% of the population uh, works in uh, uh, shift work patterns. So if you perturb the clock, there are two ways to do that. Either by, uh, by mutations, uh, you find, for example, here, Fu and I, et al found that a mutation of the clock um, uh, led to uh, decreased survival. So this is the wild type in mice. Uh, and survival is shortened when you have a mutation of per, the per G, which, which perturbs the clock. Uh, so the clock uh, seems to protect uh, the organism against uh, tumor development. Another way, you can make a lesion of the SCN, and uh, here, for example, and you can graft the tumor and show and see how it develops. And Philips Ken Levy found that um, the tumor growth here is higher when you have a lesion of the SCN, when you do not have a functional circadian clock. So once again, a protective effect of the circadian clock. But you can also uh, use another way to perturb the clock. And what has been found and what we tested in the model is the effect of chronic jet lag. It is a recurrent perturbation of the circadian clock. The, this is the normal light dark cycle, 12 hours of light, 12 hours of dark. And now if every two days, if every other day, you shorten the duration of the dark phase by eight hours, you achieve what is called chronic jet lag. And in the model, the dynamics in chronic jet lag uh, is very uh, uh, irregular. Uh, so it is either quasi-periodic or it is here uh, chaotic. And uh, chaotic dynamics was also observed in the model in uh, LD cycles, in normal LD cycles. These are, for example, the blue and red curves show the effect of the initial condition to verify the sensitivity to initial conditions. So chronic jet lag, that's the last insight, uh, uh, which I would like to mention. Uh, chronic jet lag, uh, for example, in which uh, one D phase out of two is reduced from 12 to four hours, uh, leads to uh, uh, the loss of periodic behavior and uh, the second clock beco becomes quasi-periodic or chaotic. 
Now, can we relate this irregular pattern of the circadian clock to physiological uh, observations? The, the first which may come to mind is narcolepsy. Narcolepsy is a disorder where you fall asleep irregularly. So, but uh, this was studied and uh, uh, it turns out that in narcolepsy, uh, what is involved is uh, uh, the network, uh, the circuit of orexin and hypocretin. These are two names for the same factor. And these factors promote wakefulness. And uh, it's known already for 20 years that the mutation in, in uh, hypocretin peptides, or orexin, uh, can be associated with narcolepsy. And uh, a very interesting paper uh, published uh, also some uh, 70 years ago already, uh, showed uh, that in knockout mice, lacking uh, orexin knockout mice, uh, these uh, mice have a normal circadian clock, but they have an instability, an irregular sleep pattern, like in um, narcolepsy. And uh, this is showing that uh, orexin and hypocretin play a key role. To end the talk, I would like to uh, end with an open question. Um, I discussed the superplasmatic nuclei and the role, of course, in uh, the circadian clock. There is an interesting, uh, well-known observation that uh, uh, in some animals, which are nocturnal, uh, and other animals which are diurnal, so we are di diurnal ani uh, animal species, and rats and mice and rodents are nocturnal, we have the same circadian clock. We have the same behavior of the circadian clock. So how is it possible that the same circadian clock leads to a switch between nocturnal and diurnal behavior? And so there is much work devoted to this very interesting question. And from a review published a few years ago, uh, it turns out that uh, the, the wiring diagram uh, downstream from the SCN is, not, is different. Uh, in nocturnal species and diurnal species, vasopressin has opposite effects. And this, because of that, uh, uh, they, are, they are diurnal species and nocturnal species display an inverted uh, plasma glucocone. And so this is the paper where they show the opposite actions of vasopressin on circadian corticosterone rhythm in nocturnal versus diurnal species. So there is differences in wiring of regulatory circuits downstream from the SCN with the same circadian clock. So we use the, a computational model for the mammalian circadian clock to study the molecular mechanism of the clock and relate to sleep disorders. Uh, I, I just insist on the role of circuits downstream from the SCN. Um, models have also been used to minimize the effects of shift work or jet lag. And sleep, uh, the talk was not devoted to a model for sleep. It was devoted to analyzing the influence of the circadian clock on sleep-wake cycle patterns. Uh, sleep has been modeled, uh, for example, uh, by Bobbley and co-workers, who proposed a two-process model involving circadian and homeostatic factors. So if you wish to couple the circadian clock to sleep, uh, one way to do would be to, uh, to couple the two. And this has been done by uh, people like uh, um, Postnova, uh, who wrote a recent review about that. So this is my last slide, the graphical summary. Uh, the model for the second clock um, is schematized here in simplified form. And this is the patterns of circadian behavior in LD. We found untrainment, this is normal behavior. But the familiar advanced sleep phase syndrome, there is a phase advance. In the delayed sleep phase syndrome, there is a delay. The non-24 hour, there is drifting in, in non-blind people. And then the irregular patterns in the, um, in, uh, the conditions of uh, chronic jet lag. And uh, all these results uh, and, uh, and many references which have been uh, cited only partly uh, can be found in this paper. Uh, thank you very much for the at your attention. And, uh, oops. Yeah. Thank you very much, so, Albert, for an interesting talk. Um, uh, we're a little bit over time, but uh, if uh, people have maybe, will take maybe one or two questions if possible. Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for that, by the way. <laughs> yeah. No problem. Yes. No problem. Yeah.
Um, questions? There's a quick hello from Leon Glass. Leon, yeah. yeah Thank you. Let me just say hi to Albert. <laughs> Great yes, hello, you. Leon. Hello. Yes, Good to see you. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> it's great to see you. Okay, uh, maybe I'll ask a quick yeah, question yeah. because it's been on my mind uh, uh, yes. uh, throughout the talk, to be honest. So you uh, showed this uh, diagram that, you, you know, uh, uh, the two subsystems, one that has the cry and the pair, while the other one I have, uh, I think, has the clock and uh, uh, what is the other B one? Uh, uh, B-man one, exactly. One. B yeah. One, yeah. Uh, so uh, when I look at the uh, this positive feedback and negative feedback that is uh, feeding back into the system, yeah. it seems to me that these two subsystems are both oscillators. You have like some, you know, two coupled oscillators that could uh, each one of them generate oscillations. Sure. Um, That's right. I don't. Know. I fully agree. Um, so yeah. yeah. Uh, so why don't why, uh, how, you know what I pointed out when I said there were multiple oscillations? I see. Yeah. So one could be perhaps maybe. So, uh, yeah, indeed, there are two oscillators. Okay. Yes, but there are two oscillators, but they are synchronized internally. But I, I don't hear the, the end of your question. So the, the question that I have is, is it possible to actually study the system from this angle by looking at two coupled oscillators uh, uh, and see if we could observe similar sort of dynamics uh, that you observe, at least, you know, uh, looking at uh, some of these uh, results that you've highlighted here in the summary slide. Yes. No, certainly. The, in principle, the coupling of two oscillators uh, As I mentioned, the second oscillator may be not operating in a domain of parameter values corresponding to oscillations, right? But if, even if it operates as an oscillator, when you uncouple it from the other, then they can synchronize internally. But if the coupling is loose, then you may have complex dynamics, uh, chaotic dynamics. Or, yeah. And so we observe something like that in a, in a model for the side. We identify at least four oscillatory subnetworks. And when they are strongly coupled, we have internal synchronization in continuously uh, continuous conditions, but when they are loosely coupled, then they can interact and produce complex behavior. I see. I see. So indeed, we can observe complex dynamics here. Uh, but as I said, uh, is it physiologically relevant in respect to the, the, the sleep-wake cycle? Uh, this is, I think, Another question. Uh, I not, not clear. And the narcolepsy, for example, has another origin. Okay. Um, I have a question as well. Um, is it possible that these molecular mechanisms can cause synchronization uh, of oscillations across populations that are independent of the SCN? Uh, first of all, there, there is a very important point, which is a synchronization within the SCN. Okay, within the SCN, uh, the cells, uh, ten thousands of cells, have to synchronize. And, and there are there are papers which have been studying the synchronization of uh, SCN uh, <clears throat> oscillators, uh, SCN cells, oscillating cells, uh, using the Van der Poel oscillator uh, or using uh, uh, um, other models. But um, but uh, the SCN indeed can control, uh, can synchronize circadian rhythms in peripheral uh, organs. And uh, I mentioned the SCN as a pacemaker, uh, circadian oscillator, but they are peripheral clocks, uh, which have different phases, but they are controlled by the, the SCN. So definitely, uh, the, the, the are, these are interacting clocks. But these uh, peripheral clocks can't, uh, they wouldn't synchronize um, sort of independent of the SCN. Uh, yes, yes, they can, they can, you can uncouple them. For example, uh, there is a, a circadian clock in the liver, uh, which is really which can be controlled independently by the by the, the feeding cycle, and uh, and so you can uncouple it from the SCN phase, and so uh, they are they are they are peripheral uh, uh, oscillators, but uh, but of course there is nevertheless a control by the the central clock, and, and with respect to the 
uh, uh, not everything is clear yet uh, about the control of the sleep wake cycle, but, uh, but what is clear is that, uh, the, and that's the results I mentioned about the familial advanced sleep phase syndrome or the delayed sleep phase syndrome, that uh, there is a strong control uh, by the second clock of the sleep wake cycle. And uh, I, I do have a, a second question, which is, um, so uh, these molecular mechanisms um, that are sort of intrinsic to the, the circadian rhythms of each cell, uh, are there any kind of variations that exist across cell types or uh, that are more based on cell function? Uh, so, yeah, first of all, I mentioned at the end of the talk, uh, the question of diurnal versus nocturnal animals. Uh, they have the same circadian clock, but downstream, uh, the controls may be different. Uh, but, uh, we, but the circadian clock itself um, uh, operates um, along similar principle in different organisms. In mammals, it's the same. But um, in other organisms, there are differences. For example, I mentioned Drosophila. Okay. It's not the same molecular entities. The per protein is, all, is also found in the mammals. But uh, the team protein plays a role uh, and cry. Uh, has another function in Zosfila. What is common is the design principle, which is negative indirect autoregulatory feedback. Okay? Uh, but uh, if you take cyanobacteria, for example, in cyanobacteria, you also have negative feedback on uh, transcription. But besides that, you have another mechanism which does not depend on uh, transcription. It depends only on of phosphorylation of a protein called KC, KC. And KC protein is multiply phosphorylated in a cyclical way uh, with a period of the order of 24 hours. So this is uh, an example where two different mechanisms coexist. And this has been modeled by several groups. And uh, lastly, if you take an orospora, which also was studied by the group of Dunlap, for example, uh, uh, in, in regard to the molecular mechanism of the clock. Uh, the principle is again the same. It's autoregulatory negative feedback, but the, the protein and the gene is different. The gene is called frequency, and the protein frequency represses the expression of its own gene. I see. Thank you again. Uh, it was a fascinating talk. Thank you. Hey, um, uh, since we're all over time, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Goldberger, for uh, a fascinating talk. And uh, hopefully next time we'll have you over in person to give a talk here at Canman. Yes. Indeed. <laughs> thank you very much. It's a thank you. Fascinating talk. Thanks. Yeah. We'll see you. Thank well, you. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. too. Take care. Okay, bye. Bye yeah. bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you, Albert. And take care also. Yeah. Au revoir. Yeah. Oh, 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 oui, 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 tout à fait. À bientôt.